Well, Joel, again, this is Buck Benny speaking. I have my friends uh, just Bob and Matt with me today. And we are going to be discussing a brand new series we're bringing you. Uh, we will see. I mean, I assume we're going to continue to bring you this. It, I just saw that they were out there and thought, oh, this would be a fun thing to, to present. We remember growing up and watching these episodes and everything. I still remember this one, actually, when it came on in 1973. So I was uh, nine years old when this came on. And uh, this is the very first episode of what would later become the series In Search Of. And this is In Search of Ancient Astronauts, I think it's called. And uh, what's lovely is it has Rod Serling as the narrator. And I just have, um, I think Rod Serling is fantastic. I've loved almost everything he's ever done. And uh, just the fact that he, of course, famous for The Twilight Zone being the uh, main writer and the, uh, what, not narrator, but the person who would introduce the episodes, I suppose. In this case, he, man, he narrates the entire thing. I don't think we hear another voice besides his voice the entire time. Well, I guess through interviews and things, they have maybe people talk. But uh, um, anyway, let's let's get started. So, um, Matt, uh, why don't you go first and tell us uh, one? You can tell us your thoughts on the whole thing, or any specific. What talk about whatever you like. So did anybody see the uh, World Series game last night? <laughs> <laughs> okay, not anything you like. So, Something uh, you somehow do with Rod Serling or the episode itself. <laughs> no, I was pretty excited when you uh, mentioned that this was a possibility that you wanted to have as part of our series of nerdy conversations. Uh, I loved this show growing up and i Really, until we talked about it, I was completely unaware of the, of the Rod Serling connection. I'd never seen, uh, apparently there's three of these episodes with him. Correct. Uh, I had never seen any of them. I was only familiar with uh, the episodes that were hosted by Leonard Nimoy. Those are the ones that I remember watching later in the 70s, as I am much younger than you. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> My best friend you're and fond I of pointing out. <laughs> oh, it is. It, it's always fun. Uh, my best friend and I were obsessed growing up with all the, you know, the, the mysteries of the world. The Bermuda Triangle was huge. The, uh, you know, At Atlantis and and all that, all, all those kind of things that are explored in the uh, in the series. And so, anytime this was on, we we loved. We loved watching the show, um, so it was cool to kind of see the the origin of it with this first uh, Rod Serling kind of. It was, I guess it was a TV special at the time. Yes, maybe not even a series uh, or a, a pilot or anything. It was just a, maybe a one off or a few episodes. Yeah, I think was, I think honestly, it was supposed to be a one off. I think it was going to be a one time thing, but then it was so popular that they decided they had to bring it back and and slowly grew into the well, sounds like they were kind of doing a tv special about that uh the book the chariots of the gods uh was kind of where most of the information seemed to come from that he was highlighting so one thing i i found super frustrating about this episode that is changed in the later ones is they would take in the later episodes they'll take something and they'll dive into it and they'll talk to five experts about this or whatever and and but they'll, they'll really focus in on one. And yet this, this was all focused on ancient astronauts, but I felt like it was, it was pretty shallow in the, hey, here's a thing. Oh, look at this. Here's another thing and, the, and another thing. And here's another thing. And without really, you know, like they talk about, here's the frescoes that maybe portray aliens. And that was pretty much all they said. <laughs> it was like, I, I noticed this guy looks too. like he might be playing a spaceship. And then, and then it was, and then it was gone. And, and like, instead of, well, here's the frescoes, here's when they were painted, here's when this came from, and here's what we think this means and why we think this means this. And here's some more context for these frescoes. I was like, hey, this is a thing. Okay, let's move. Oh, now look over here. Here's an ancient squirrel. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, I would agree 100%. That's it, what I found was was lacking in this episode. It just went from thing to thing to thing, like you're saying. There was no... And you'd have questions in your head. You know, you'd be like, 
Couldn't that just be so? Like, well, uh, well, some of my favorites. Let me let me just throw this one thing out. Uh, so many times they were showing an astro. What they thought they thought. Oh, this is an ancient picture of somebody squatting down in a uh, in a you know space capsule and whatever. And I was thinking some of those seems like maybe it's somebody squatting down going to the bathroom and they are. And, and they're saying it's something more than that. I don't know. Because <laughs> you essentially are in the same position if you're going to the bathroom or if you're in a space capsule. So, anyway, back to you. Well, the, the, so the one that, the one of those, so one thing I will say that this this did, I, I got a lot of enjoyment out of this episode for, just for the purpose that it, I opened up about 15 tabs on my browser while I was watching this uh, for things that, uh, I'm going to, I'm gonna look more about up about that later. I'm gonna look. So I learned some interesting things. The, uh, um, but then a couple of them was like, with, and and I know I have, you know, the the advantage of the internet and whatnot. But I mean, the the one thing I thought was funny that they clearly cherry pick is they show that fresco. That's the one that jumped out at me. It's like, here's here's these things that we say are spaceships, mm-hmm. and you look at the one they show and we're like, okay, I can see where that's a space capsule. But then when you look at the whole fresco and you see that the other one that's on there, it's like those so clearly without, in, in two seconds, I look at that and I say, oh, those are personifications of the sun and moon. Because mm. the one is clearly, I mean, they're just, if you look at them together, you're like, oh, that, that clearly, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what that is. That is not, that's not spaceships, but okay. Um, but I, I spent a bunch of time just looking at, okay, so, Oh, I didn't know about this, you know, this, what, oh, the, the one that I thought was actually super interesting was when they're talking about the, uh, the South Pacific islands where people were, you know, watching the skies, waiting for the return of, of the explorers or whatever from, that came, that came down from the skies and left modern technology and whatnot. So that, that is essentially to get the, the gist of that. It's, it's that in World War II, we came and set up a base there temporarily. Uh, we had planes coming in and out, that sort of thing. And so then we left after World War II. And so, the, the natives that were there then started building what in the in the in the, in this episode looks like airplanes made out of wood and things that they look like they're almost worshiping or something is sort of yeah, what I got from it. Now Matt so there's a there's a there's actually so there's actually a phenomenon called cargo cults. That's what they um, are. That started. Uh, they actually started before that. The the idea that they really blew up uh, because both the Japanese and American sides both did the same kind of thing, where they'd go grab an island, and the, their service people would, you know, not think of, they didn't they didn't have a prime directive. They didn't mind interfering with Stone Age technologies. They'd just Oh, you want some of this stuff? Here, here's a here's a gun. It's pretty cool. And here's you know whatever whatever mo- whatever piece of modern technology or you know you're giving Stone Age te- you're you're giving modern tools to a Stone Age technology. They're gonna love this stuff, right? Like, oh, this metal axe is way better than my stone axe. Awesome. Um, so they ended up kind of, they like said, uh, with some imitative behaviors, uh, trying to get the uh, you know the the white people from the sky to come back, and so they're you know they're like I said they're building airplanes and and uh, transmit they'll they'll build things that look like radio towers out of bamboo and or what or whatever wood they have and uh, there's uh, some of the some of the rituals that they would perform were uh, recorded as being like uh, parade marching like like military they'd have they'd hold sticks like they were rifles and march in formation. As, wow. as imitative behavior, trying to recall, you know, more of this, the blessings from the sky. That's so interesting and, and so sad at the same time. And it sounds like it sounds like it's a phenomenon that actually started with some of the South Pacific exploration in the in the eighteen thirties or fifties or whatever. When, uh, but it, yeah, they they just referred to all all of. Uh, basically anything from off the you know for the, the white people brought as cargo because you know we refer to a ship's cargo right. but that was that was collectively what they they wanted more cargo wow 
interesting yeah. Uh, yeah i thought that that struck out to me too is you know really interesting part of this episode and you just made it even more interesting like i said it was a, it was a one-off little thing and they they talk about it at the beginning is they're they're watching the skies waiting for their time I'm like really that sounds like that sounds a little bit like rod serling being a little dramatic is that, yeah. are they really sitting there watching the skies i'm like man some places they kind of are <laughs> yeah yeah or were at least at the time I don't... well and again uh, when you say it's Rod Serling being a little dramatic or whatever, it's it's the producers of the show and the director of the show and everything. I don't think Rod did much of anything but read the script, probably. probably. Uh, as, I don't, I, as far as I know, he wasn't overly involved in any of this other than being the narrator. But um, Bob, I thought we'll switch over to you because we haven't heard your take on this. And also you have some strange guy as your background now. Yes, I'll clean that in a second. So... Um, like Matt, I love this stuff when I was a kid. Still do. <laughs> I remember my dad. That's why I decided to bring this across because I thought, okay, with Serling and Nimoy, it ties into science fiction. Plus, also some of the stuff they're sharing is almost fiction, sciencey. But uh, like, I knew Bob loved it, and so I thought, well, let's do it. So anyway, Bob, I remember I, my dad yelling at me because I was reading Charles Burlett's Secrets of the Bermuda Triangle, and I couldn't stop, and he needed help with the boat, and he kept asking. And I kept reading, and eventually he yelled at me. So I had a <laughs> um, yeah, this picture. So if you want your fix, they do on history uh, every Friday, most seasons, a show called Ancient Aliens, 179 episodes featuring this gentleman, Giorgio Sukalos, okay. and his hair. Uh, <laughs> Two characters. <laughs> <laughs> And literally the only problem I have with this show is that it's on the History Channel. Like, <laughs> this is so is, nice. on, on that show, everything is freaking aliens. It's like Bigfoot, he's been created by aliens. Einstein was influenced by aliens. Everything has to do with ancient aliens on this show. They, they make some huge leaps, but they do go into rather yeah min, minute detail on every subject, given they're out, like I said, 179 episodes and 15 seasons. So the, the whole Van Danikin thing is totally alive. And is I think this episode is a lot like his book. His book is kind of like that. It kind of jumps around. And he makes a lot of kind of leaps. But still sort of intriguing if you think back. Uh, all these civilizations around this time are making pyramids for some reason and they supposedly don't aren't connected together. Or were they? Right. And there's, I mean, there's, there's certainly some intriguing things about why, you know, there's, there's lots of things that develop simultaneously in different places around the world. And you wonder what, like, so why do so many religions around the world that happen without contact with each other simultaneously have so much in common? About, I mean, the, the Messiah thing, you know, is predominant everywhere almost. <laughs> you know, there's, yeah. That shows up, you know, all over the place in, in places that had no contact with each other. And it could just be, a, you know, that kind of desire for, you know, some, some, someone's going to come and make this all better. And that, that's like kind of a universal desire, I think. <laughs> but uh, and so maybe that's just a, it's just a part of human nature to, you know, kind of hope for wish for, pray for a, a savior figure to come and, and make it all better uh, or, t or take you to a better place. But uh, yeah, there's, and, and yeah, like I said, lots of things like, why are so many people building pyramids? Why? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's interesting. And they definitely, they take, they take a lot, they take a lot of leaves. And I, I, I mean, not, I took it very seriously when I was a kid and as an adult, I still enjoy it. One for the nostalgia and two for the, that's yeah, just kind of fun to think about aspect of it. Yes. But yeah. certainly some of the stuff like you, you can't take, you can't, can't take most of this too seriously for sure. Uh, although a lot of people do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely entertaining. And yeah, the, the ancient alien guy is, is pretty hilarious. If you have, if you haven't watched any of the, cause he's at least, at least his, if it's not him, then the character that he plays the wild-haired conspiracy guy is very entertaining because he's, I'm not saying it was ancient aliens, but it was definitely ancient aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's aliens. 
well, literally so, everything. And it's, uh, I mean, when your show is is called Ancient Aliens, you kind of have to. Yeah, everything yeah. does kind of. I mean, that's literally the name of your show. You kind of have to bring it all around. To that. <laughs> um, so, the one thing I wanted to point out, and it jumped out at me, like, wait, I have to go back and listen to this again. Was it felt a little bit like a cheat or like you're being trolled if you watched this whole thing and took it at all seriously? Because the literally the last words by the most reputable person that they had on the show at the end of the show, they have Carl Sagan. Yeah. And literally the last words, it certainly doesn't even come on and wrap it up. The last words of the show are Carl Sagan saying something along the lines of, that's kind of fun to think about it, but there's not a smidge of cred- a smidgen of credible evidence. And then it rolls the credits and that's the, <laughs> like, <laughs> that's an that's an interesting way because usually if you're trying to present an argument right for something you don't close with the counter argument <laughs> you no you would think you might have ca- carl sagan say because because he's carl sagan and then you might have your narrator rod serling come back up and say or could it really Question. You know, or questions, something. Per, questions persist. Yes, uh, I mean that's that's the that's the biggest thing, and that's one of the things that's great about this is like the uh, and, and the continuing series is it's it's always like and they and this is a the trope they play with in in radio all the time too when they're try, trying to like present a found footage type thing in in radio is like we'll leave it for the viewer to decide. Yes, like. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't even do that it's like they just they kind of do that through the whole show it's like could this be this could this be this could this be this and then they close with the most credible person saying it's not <laughs> it's probably not they could be but it's yeah. probably not that <laughs> like well and i think for for our viewers and listeners out there um what's <clears throat> too with this series this one is like we said a lot different from the future ones in that there wasn't a lot of scientific support and things. It was just kind of one thing after another after another. Uh, in future episodes, we'll get a lot more scientists that come on and historians that come on and, and lots of other folks to support um, what they're talking about. And I think that helps um, give the series a little more gravitas. And uh, But this is a great introduction. And shoot, I just love to hear Rod Serling talk and talk and talk. It works fine for me. Uh, and we'll see what the next two because i haven't watched the next two recently to see if it gets more like the series is going to be or is it stay in this mode i'm not sure so you'll have to stay tuned in the next couple weeks and see and then we'll go off into the leonard nimoy episodes that we have available on youtube and uh be talking about them so i hope you're going to enjoy this episode and uh before we get to it, first thing I want to say, or last thing I want to say, or whatever, is uh, I've got a beard going on, and people are going, why is he wearing this beard? This is to tie into our Mirror Universe episodes of Discovery that we just uh, talked about, and uh, I forgot to take it off, so I've got the beard still on, but I will uh, (laughs) eliminate that in future podcasts, (laughs) because it makes no sense for this one. (laughs) Back over... Too. Well, Bob's laughing, so I'll go back to Jim. Is there anything else you want to talk about about the whole series in search of or anything? Or oh, is Jim here now? Oh, fine. I'll go over to Matt. <laughs> 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 He's doing his best to, to make me not say Jim, but hey, it's not helping. <laughs> no, it was it just it was really enjoyable to see the uh, the origin. I think of of one of the shows that I loved as a kid, and I'm looking forward to kind of diving back in and watching more of a show I really haven't watched much of in 20 or 40 years. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Bob, you got anything else to share on that? Yeah, I love it. It's going to be awesome. Okay. Well, and and let me uh, share for viewers the other thing. I explained my beard. I need to explain uh, Matt's face a little bit. <laughs> it is It is the character of not Jim, that is played on The Office. And so he chose that to help remind me to not say Jim, which I'm constantly calling Matt Jim. I think it's because historically, Bob, Jim, and I grew up together. 
And Matt has always kind of reminded me of Jim in certain ways. I'm not sure the way they get things out, the way they say things, whatever. So I tend to, when Jim's not here, to refer to Matt as Jim, which you probably noticed in some of the episodes. So now uh, Matt has not only used the face of not Jim, he also, as his little indicator that shows his name, it says not Jim. Now you guys can't see that, but I see that. And so I really should not call him Jim. And yet I still have at least once or twice in the course of this uh, intro. So <laughs> I am beyond, beyond help. I don't know. Anyway, enjoy in search of someday we'll do in, in search of why uh, Buck thinks that Jim and Matt are the same person. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, enjoy. And we'll see you next time. Space. An endless tapestry of stars reaching toward infinity. Scattered through its vastness are 100 billion planets on which life theoretically could exist. If only 1% of that life is intelligent, there could be 1 million civilizations out there. And of that million, it is conceivable that one discover the secrets of space travel. It is possible that ancient astronauts went in search of life beyond their own world and found it on the planet Earth. The existence of other intelligent beings in the universe intrigues the men of tomorrow's science. The exobiologists, students of life in outer space. Dr. Harold P. Klein of NASA's Ames Research Center. The knowledge that this kind of life that we know of in this planet is not the only one will have very profound influence whether that other life is more advanced or less advanced than we are. The very knowledge that uh, life can originate uh, spontaneously will have, I believe, very profound effects on the thinking of man in terms of what he is and what his role is in the universe. Now, it has been suggested by other people that maybe life on Earth was brought here by a visitor from another planet. Dr. James Lawless. Uh, while this possibility is remote, it certainly can't be excluded on the basis of the results which we have found. If ancient astronauts did land here, what effect would they have had upon early Earthmen? Perhaps they were worshipped, feared, loved. Perhaps they brought gifts a new world of knowledge, or simply the principle of the lever. If we accept the premise that beings from another civilization visited here ages ago, then some of the mysteries of our past take on a new and startling light. The Baghdad Museum in Iraq has on display a clay vase dating back before the birth of Christ. The vase is also a 2,000-year-old battery. A small copper tube is placed in the narrow neck, and a rod made of a metal alloy is inserted in the copper tube. When filled with hydrochloric acid, it produces an electric current. The vase was, it seems, a primitive galvanic cell battery. Count Volta is credited with having invented the electric cell 2,500 years later. Was the secret of electricity revealed to man thousands of years ago? Is it possible that this planet Earth has been visited by travelers from outer space? Did they wander through the throbbing light years of the universe in search of other life and find it here? Places on this planet where life exists almost unchanged since antiquity. Less than three decades ago, machines descended from the skies to land on a remote region in the South Pacific. The primitive inhabitants were puzzled and frightened by the invasion. 
The visitors were light-skinned creatures who didn't hunt or fish, yet never lacked food. They came from heaven. They had to be gods. They were, in fact, American servicemen, sent to construct airfields and military installations during the Second World War. When the war was over, they went home, back into the skies. The natives began making straw and bamboo fetishes resembling airplanes. To this day, they scan the heavens day and night, watching and waiting for the return. from the encounter between a primitive people and visitors from a highly developed, technically superior society. All men were at one time primitive. It is possible to imagine that our own forebears may well have reacted in the same way to visitors from outer space. is a storehouse, an archive of unexplained phenomena. Gigantic creations, in effigy of what? To appease or acclaim whom? Early stone carvers left silent records for their descendants, to tell us something but not quite enough. Statues modeled after strange beings, statements to the scope of their awesome powers. Folk legend surrounds their origin. Strange stories of gods who appeared riding across the skies in flaming chariots of light. Whole civilizations were structured around these gods. Civilizations which at one time flourished and then mysteriously disappeared. Only stone relics survive to give mute testimony to their time. Their true history has been the cause of much scientific inquiry and romantic speculation. Erich von Däniken, a German professor possessed of the mind of a scientist and the imagination of a romantic, wrote a book called Chariots of the Gods. He stated that sometime in the distant past, man was visited by intelligent beings from outer space. What in olden times might have been heresy is today intriguing speculation. Von Däniken traveled to all corners of the world, gathering evidence in support of his theory. Or is it a theory? Judge for yourself. Istanbul, the city on the Golden Horn. Here stands the palace of Topkapi. A curious set of maps are kept here, which were found in the Orient by the Turkish Admiral Piri Reis. The oldest of these maps dates back to approximately the first century A.D. They are most likely copies of still earlier maps. As astronauts high above Cairo, we would view the Earth in the configuration seen on the old maps. The outlines of the modern maps are the same as the pattern visible on the Piri Reis charts. Another map in the collection shows a region which is still largely unexplored, the Antarctic. The existence of Antarctica as a continent was only established in the 19th century, and it wasn't even explored until 1911 by a Norwegian, Roald Amundsen. The map dates from 1532, a time when the techniques and basic equipment were unavailable to determine longitude. The question lingers. What was the source of information? The world's first great cities might have been constructed, according to von Däniken, under the supervision of the same being who offered instruction for making the maps of Piri Reis. Teotihuacan lies on a broad, flat plain curtained by mountains in central Mexico. It was once the center of the highly advanced Aztec Empire. 
When the Spaniards arrived in the early 16th century, they found an established society of artisans and intellectuals. The name Teotihuacan means where the gods reside. And the city of the gods is dominated by the Pyramid of the Sun. It is 216 feet high and forms a small mountain weighing two and a half million tons. The Aztecs worshiped the sun as the source of all life. They offered human sacrifices to the sun god atop stone pyramids marked with glyphics. Vague symbols relating the history of an ancient people. Archaeology seeks answers to questions about man's past by digging through what he has left behind. Here they uncovered a chain of riddles which stretches across the expanse of modern Mexico. A mile to the south is the temple of Quetzalcoatl. Legend tells us that he was a light-skinned, bearded man who came from the stars. Supposedly he taught men law, the arts, and the cultivation of corn. The head of a great feathered serpent represents the god Quetzalcoatl. When Quetzalcoatl finished his mission on Earth, he departed to his native star, promising to come back someday. It is a pervasive part of mythology that gods fly to the stars with a pledge to return. The strain runs through all folklore. The ruins of the deserted city of Tula rest about 20 miles from Teotihuacan. It was one of the cities supposedly linked in legend to a ladder hung in the sky. Monumental sculptures stand a silent watch over the remains, guardians of an eternal mystery. They appear to be warriors, dressed alike, wearing unusual helmets. They carry some sort of box-like unit on their chests. Perhaps they are weapons or communications equipment. Unrecognizable tools or controls are clasped in their hands. The nearby sacred well of Cenote forms a perfectly round crater in the rock. It is unlikely that it could have been formed naturally or by human excavation. It does, however, resemble a crater made by the exhaust gases of a very powerful rocket engine. To the east of Cenote is the ancient Mayan city of Chichen Itza. About 600 AD, the entire Mayan population fled northward. There is no trace of war, plague, or famine to account for the move. Outstanding astronomers, Mayans calendared the year by constructing a central pyramid with 365 steps. They also developed a formula to predict eclipses without ever knowing about the revolution of the Earth, Moon, and Sun. There is no way of telling how they discovered these secrets, but von Daniken believes that some ancient astronaut may have told them of the solar system in which they lived. A stone relief portrays a god in a helmet with projections resembling antennae. The Mayans name their patron Kuku Khan. In every 6,000 years, the Mayan calendar is off by only one day. Such was the gift of Kuku Khan. Kuku Khan supposedly came from the stars and returned to them, leaving the Mayans to build observatories to search the heavens for him. Perhaps with our modern observatories and telescopes, we are still searching for Kuku Khan and Quetzalcoatl, who deserted to ancient skies. Modern science examines the heavens in search of information. Data, according to Dr. Werner von Braun, that gives us perspective on our own brief existence in the firmament. 
I think it is important to remember that uh, distant stars are not only far away from us in terms of miles, but uh, life on other planets can also be very far away from us in terms of time. Uh, the Earth is believed to be approximately five billion years old, and if you condense mentally these five billion years uh, into one year, then the presence of men on this earth would be about one minute out of that one year and the period since man uh, understood radio and was capable of effectively communicating with heavenly bodies outside of the earth uh, would only be approximately one second out of that year. So if you want to communicate with another heavenly body and intelligent life thereon, you have to reach that other heavenly body also at a time when these people have invented the radio and know how to operate it and to have their receivers going, so to speak. But we had no receivers going, even a mere 50 years ago. We were too busy with the steam engine and the biplane. Dr. Harold Klein. It is highly possible that advanced civilizations have in the past or may in the present try or have tried to uh, contact us, to uh, survey us, to uh, watch us. We cannot rule that out. We have no indications of that. It may be equally possible that a really intelligent society has watched us for some time, has looked us over and decided based on our activities that uh, this planet is beneath their dignity, so to speak, and is simply not worth bothering with. Quite possibly, we were too backward to bother with, but we have come a long way in a short time, and we are prepared to reach out into the universe. Writer and sociologist Eric Hoffer suggests a reason for our return to space. He wrote, I always felt that man is a stranger on this planet, a total stranger. I always played with the fancy, maybe a contagion from outer space is the seed of man. Hence our prior occupation with heaven, with the sky, with the stars, the gods, somewhere out there in outer space. It is a kind of homing impulse. We are drawn to where we came from. In the seventh decade of the 20th century, the landscape of the moon became familiar. Man went to the moon on his first mission in search of life. With him, he had to take his own life support system. He was encased in a portable environment, susceptible to deadly radiation. If space travelers from another planet were to visit Earth, they too might find the environment hostile, if not deadly. They, too, would have to travel as self-contained units. But whatever their basic forms, in appearance they may have resembled modern astronauts. On a rocky ledge in the Sahara Desert is a drawing estimated to have been painted there over 15,000 years ago. If not an astronaut, then what is this floating apparition? Henri Loti, the early French archaeologist, discovered the image of a 19-foot giant and called him the great god Mars. Across the Mediterranean, at Valcominica, near Brescia, Italy, rock paintings have tried to tell their story since before recorded time. They are portrayals of strange beings in bulky overalls. Their helmets seem to carry antennae. In their hands are clasped some manner of tool or weapon. Still more evidence can be found in a 2,000-year-old rock painting found in Japan. 
In the rough, rocky countryside of Northwest Australia, there are scores of rock paintings which date back far in time. Drawings which are probably some of the earliest messages from prehistoric man. Sketches represent the activities of one Gina, a legendary goddess of the Milky Way. She too came from heaven to instruct the children of Earth. Von Daniken believes there were models, possibly even one model for all the deities found recorded in rock. The mysteries of the past manifest themselves on all continents. Within the depths of a temple in the ancient Mayan city of Palanque in Central America, Von Daniken came upon a stone relief of what is apparently a man seated in a capsule, watching something intently. His hand seemed to be operating some undefinable controls. His foot pressing a lever. And at the rear of the capsule are jets trailing flames behind them. He seems to be dressed for the job in trousers with a broad belt, a sort of jacket, tight-fitting at the wrists. The chair is well upholstered to absorb the shock of acceleration. Mayan legend says that he represents their space traveling god, Kuku Klan, the winged god of Palanque. He was carved sometime in the 7th century. The possibility haunts us that this figure was the artist's rendering of the ancient astronauts who inspired the Mayan culture. The church of the monastery of Desané was decorated with mysterious frescoes some 500 years ago. The monastery is hidden away in the peaceful countryside of southern Yugoslavia. High above the chapel, almost out of sight, the fresco silently challenges our minds with its startling story. It depicts what may have been the first air battle to be witnessed by man almost 500 years before the known discovery of flight. In the first capsule, a man is seated with his hand on some form of guidance mechanism. He appears to be racing across the sky in an attempt to escape from a pursuing ship. We can easily imagine jets at the rear of these aerodynamic forms. On the earth below them, people cower in fear as this air battle wages in the skies. If not an astronaut, then what reality might have inspired the frescoes of Dessane? Myths, legends, legacies of ancient man have not all been lost in ambiguous reference. History is the scribe of man. There are records in cuneiform, Sanskrit, Amharic, Tibetan, and languages which have not yet even been deciphered. New texts are constantly being discovered. Some, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, are readily understandable to scholars. Translating other fragments of written history is laborious and time-consuming. Only a minute fraction of surviving texts have actually been transcribed. Accounts of godlike visitors abound. For example, in the books of the Tibetan Kanchur. The Kanchur consists of over a thousand volumes containing the holy texts of Lamaism. Their secret code is the most complex ever devised. To date, only one one hundredth of the Kanchur has been deciphered. The resulting translations are full of references to gods appearing in the sky of the luminous pearls and transparent spheres in which they lived. 
Once the books have been further deciphered, they may well yield much more information about mysterious space visitors. Closer to Western civilization, we have one of the world's most detailed records, the Bible. The Bible says that the Lord caused to rain upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire. God sent his messengers to warn Lot's family of impending disaster. The angels told Lot, flee for your life, do not look back. Flee to the hills lest you be consumed. The messengers were insistent that he leave the city immediately. Von Donneken wondered if they had foreknowledge of an impending cataclysmic explosion. It appears certain that Sodom and Gomorrah were leveled, laid waste at a single stroke. All traces of the communities have disappeared. So complete was the destruction. The report of the catastrophe ends. Then he looked down and beheld and lo, the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. Mount Horeb in the Sinai Range rises more than 6,500 feet above sea level. Here Moses received the Ten Commandments. Here too he was given the blueprints for the Ark of the Covenant. In chapter 25 of the second book of Moses, directions are given for the construction of the holy tabernacle. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood, and you shall overlay it with pure gold within and without shall you overlay it. And you shall make upon it a molding of gold round about. Moses was to provide special shoes and clothing which would properly insulate his workmen. Moses was warned that no one should come near the structure. It represented a mortal danger. And though Moses would hear a voice from the covering plate, no figure could be seen. If we were to build a replica of the ark today, according to Moses' instructions, we would have a condenser charged with several hundred volts. Could the gold sheath have been a form of loudspeaker, a two-way radio, reproducing a voice from afar, it is part of the Von Donneken theory, a romantics explanation of biblical text based on imagination and wonder. In the fragmentary histories from the Bible to the scripts of Babylon, there are tantalizing views of Earth seen from the distance, seen from space, seen by whom? Was it the vision of ancient astronauts communicated to the primitive population of a still young planet Earth? If we were to land on a strange planet, we would probably avoid its magnetically disruptive poles. If travelers from outer space were to land here, a likely location almost on the equator would be Egypt. The pyramids, eternal mysteries in themselves, provide additional evidence to support the premise that Earth was visited by ancient astronauts. The Great Pyramid rises to a height of 477 feet, 2,300,000 stone blocks, each a crushing two and a half tons, each perfectly fitting, climb toward the sky. The stones were transported from the Makadam Mountains on the far side of the Nile. 20,000 workmen hauling 10 blocks a day would need 640 years, more than 30 generations, to build one pyramid. To some, the massive structures were not designed as tombs for the pharaohs, but are in reality vast astronomical calculators Passageways, for example, from the interior, 
point directly at the North Star, the way back to the heavens. If we multiply the height of the pyramid by one billion, it equals almost exactly the distance from the Earth to the Sun. At the end of the 16th century, the Dutch mathematician Ludolf arrived at the figure pi, by which one can determine the circumference of a circle. If we divide the perimeter of the base of the pyramid by twice the height, we get exactly the figure pi, which Ludolf only found 4,000 years later. All the evidence leads von Donneken to conclude that the pyramid is linked to the arrival of visitors from outer space and that they may have used it as a marking place, a map reference for navigation. When modern Egypt chose to construct the Aswan Dam, there stood one obstacle. The flooding would submerge the 3,000-year-old temple of Abu Simbel. Over a hundred nations answered UNESCO's plea to save the monument. Latest equipment and engineering techniques were used. Still, it took three years to accomplish. Because centuries were needed for the original builders to create the temples, it is probable they honor no single pharaoh. They stand, however, in tribute to the gods of the sun, the center of Egyptian religions, and to those who return from earth to the skies. The Salisbury Plain lies along the Wales border. A large mound rises ominously from the level expanse. The legend surrounding it suggests that it was a place of burial, not unlike the pyramids of Egypt. Close by stands Stonehenge, rock formations strewn about like so many toy blocks. It is believed to have been built 2,000 years ago. According to legend, Merlin, the magician of King Arthur's court, transported the huge slabs by magical incantations from what is now Scotland. Recent studies have employed computers to measure the distances and placements of the stones. These findings prove to some extent that Stonehenge served as a giant calendar and observatory. By visually lining up specific points, an almost exact calculation can be made as to the movement of the stars and planets. Even with computers, it has taken us years to arrive at these figures. 2,000 years ago, this area of England was inhabited only by primitive tribal people. Some still believe that Stonehenge is a temple built by the ancient Druids, the priests of the pagan Celts, and was the site of witches' conclaves and human sacrifice. The Druids still exist and continue to conduct their religious services on this site. It has been suggested that the Druids may not have built this place, but simply taken it over as their shrine. If so, then there is no trace of who might have built and left it behind. Tribes that vanished, whole civilizations that disappeared. It has happened too many times to be coincidence. Guarding the headwaters of the Amazon River are the ruins of Machu Picchu, an outpost of Peruvian Inca society. Some archaeologists suggest that the Incas found they could not extend their empire into the treacherous Amazon jungle. And so, here they stopped, and here they died. There is a curious folk legend surrounding the origin of this fortress. It is said to have been built by a divine race of light-skinned, auburn-haired descendants of the god Verichochus, who arrived in a flaming chariot. Nothing remains of these supposed people, but the legend goes on to say that they abandoned their citadel and returned to the skies. They left only the ruins of their mountaintop city for us to wonder at. The construction of defensive citadels was common to many tribal communities. 
On the African continent in the bushlands of southern Rhodesia are the ruins of Simbabwe, meaning the heart of the lion. It is constructed of brick-shaped granite rocks, all exactly alike as if produced in a factory. 20,000 tons of identical building stones. They were laid to a height of over 30 feet to form walls which have stood for thousands of years. What masons trimmed and piled these stones with such astonishing perfection? Were they the ancestors of Bushmen whose straw huts surround the ruins? Or members of a visiting group of master builders? The mystery carried von Daniken back to the Valley of the Kings in Egypt near Luxor. The valley was another royal burial ground of the pharaohs, the god kings. Not pyramids of stone, but a small mountain range converted to the use of the dead. The entrances were hidden, little more than windows into the rock, with steep stairs and winding passageways leading to the tomb of the nine-year-old pharaoh god Tutankhamun. The crypt is hollowed directly out of stone, and incredibly intricate murals decorate the walls and ceilings. Archaeologists have carefully studied the markings and meanings, but von Donegan points out one interesting fact. They could not have been painted by firelight. The ceilings show no trace of soot, and so no torches or oil lamps were used. What then was the light source? Markings found in this and other tombs are portraits of the god Osiris. Osiris played an important role in Egyptian religious belief. After giving knowledge to the world, he left the earth and exists in the heavens. Each dead pharaoh, the kings of earth, joined the spirit of Osiris in the heavens. Their mummified remains were prepared for the journey. In the golden armor casing, whom were they imitating? Outside the cave crypt stand the remains of the ancient mortuary, the temple of Amenhotep III. Here the Egyptian priests preserve the remains of their rulers. We will never know the origins of the science of mummification. Perhaps it was an imitation of a physical conservation method used by extraterrestrial visitors. The secrets died along with the mortuary during the great earthquake in the year 27 BC. Some distance away, guarding the entrance to this temple of the dead, rests the Memnon Colossi, 2,000 years old, 52 feet high, each weighing over a thousand tons. It is difficult for us to imagine them being moved from the distant quarries by manpower alone. And so the sentinels of the temple evoke images of a time when the activity inside was directed by godlike visitors who came as masters to earth. The Sphinx, symbol of the riddle, the eternal enigma, the head of a man, the body of a lion. This fierce stone creature faces the rising sun the flaming chariot of the Egyptian gods. It is meant to protect the sunship when it lands to carry the pharaohs back to the heavens. Secrets in stone abound throughout the world. Easter Island, Isle of a Thousand Mysteries, minute, lost in the watery expanse of the South Pacific, 3,000 miles off the coast of Chile. The inhabitants call their island Marakitirani, which means eyes looking up to heaven. The neighboring atoll is called the island of the bird people, creatures with human bodies in the heads of birds. Von Donegan suggests that these bird heads could also be helmets equipped with a type of mask. 
The island's ancient legends tell of flying people who arrived amidst fire and thundering noise. The landscape is dominated by volcanic cratered lakes. Today about 2,000 people live here. There were never more than 4,000 natives at any time. Of the total population, 70% were women, children or the elderly. The majority of able-bodied men was needed for the production of food. Thus the number of workmen was so small that it would have been impossible for them to create the more than 600 gigantic stone figures found everywhere on the island. Many of the stone gods stand 65 feet high and weigh nearly 400 tons. Most of the sculptures are but partly exposed. Only excavation reveals their true size. The figures are all the same. An unusual type of human wearing the same haughty, taciturn expression. One statue, unearthed by explorer Thor Heyerdahl, suggests man's role. Unlike the others, it has a rounded head and is kneeling. The workshop at the volcanic crater, Ranoraraku, has stone so hard that repeated hammering with a stone chisel hardly scratches it. The colossi carved here were removed to distances as much as 12 miles from this location. There was no army of slaves for labor, no wood for rollers, nor the slightest traces to suggest that the sculptures were dragged across the island. And so they lie here, mute, eyes looking up to heaven. Easter Island might have been the key to many mysteries. When it was first discovered, a group of wooden tablets covered with hieroglyphics were found. But zealous missionaries burned them, sealing the secrets of the monoliths. So we must look elsewhere for explanations. The legends of Easter Island claim that the stone giants moved themselves with the help of mana, a mysterious force which only two priests could invoke. And that one day the priest disappeared, and so did the mana. What was mana? Von Daniken wondered if there were strangers from other planets possessed of extraordinary powers. Did they have the ability to defy the laws of gravity? To this day, Easter Island exerts an unusually strong magnetism. The report of a French expedition in 1964 ends as follows. Since there are inexplicable magnetic forces and unusual geological phenomena on Easter Island, one cannot exclude the possibility of extraterrestrial contacts. line from Easter Island is the Bay of Pisco along the coast of southern Peru. From the ground there is what appear to be a meaningless set of lines, but from a high altitude they form a trident 300 feet long pointing the way inland. Pointing the way to what? Across the scorched and rocky terrain are spread the remains of deserted ancient cities. An entire civilization, now vanished, once flourished around the mysterious plain of Nazca. 
Lines running toward us, away. Lines which mean nothing from the ground. Long furrows cut into the iron-rich parched soil, cut there at least 2,000 years ago. From a great height, from an aircraft for instance, the lines fall into focus. We see a spider, an eagle, a peacock, and a hummingbird, none of which can be recognized from the ground. And there is no observation point, no mountain nearby, overlooking the plane. The giant drawings must have been directed by someone hovering high above. Straight as arrows, one huge geometric puzzle. Some lines parallel, some intersecting. Starting nowhere and ending nowhere. The conclusion reached by von Däniken is that the lines represent a landing field. The plain of Nazca is a gigantic abandoned airport. Landing strips, roads and flattened beds that resemble rocket launch ramps were cut into the plateau. In a radius of 1,000 miles, enduring archaeological mysteries abound. And the question arises, was this the center, the base camp of an ancient astronaut colony? Around the world we have seen carvings in Japan, Egypt, Australia, Yugoslavia. And all bear a striking resemblance to the carvings at Nazca. Was Earth visited by creatures, astronauts from another planet? We have only fragments, starlit night, and allow yourself the freedom to wonder. Giant radio telescopes are scanning the stars for signals. Some are even sending signals, not to anyone in particular, but to anyone who may be able to hear them. By some incredible coincidence, perhaps we will establish a dialogue with an extraterrestrial community, even if that conversation is only a matter of meaningless blips and dots. NASA recently launched an aluminum greeting card into space, addressed in effect to whom it may concern. Etched on the plaque are the nude figures of a man and a woman, two-digit computer code numbers, and a diagram showing Earth's location within the nine planets of our solar system. A message to whatever intelligent life there may be in the universe. Hello from Earth to some wandering ancient astronaut. NASA is especially interested in the possibility of life on the planet Mars. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California has had a direct line to Mars via the Mariner 9 spacecraft, which has been taking extensive photographs as it orbits the red planet. Mars is a world significantly like the Earth in terms of atmosphere, temperature, and gravity. 
It is also the closest and easiest to explore in depth. To date, no recognizable life has been detected. But the same was true of previous Mars missions. The last time photographs were taken, scientists agreed that there was definitely no life on Mars. However, the smallest area the spacecraft's camera could focus on was three miles wide. Therefore, the only things we might have missed are a couple of mile-long elephants. Dr. Carl Sagan is one of the directors of the Mariner mission exploring Mars. And he has a special interest in the possibilities of intelligent life in the universe. The question arises, might there have been a visit to the Earth in historical times? There are popular books on this subject. Um, it's an idea which people find exciting. It's a kind of mm, scientific justification of theological belief which people would rather believe uh, uh, in any case. Uh, it's kind of modern dress for old-time religion. Well, what about that? Is, it, is that possible or not? I can only say that you can't exclude the possibility, but there's not a smidgen of evidence that is compelling. Yeah.